Welcome to the Sarah Stevenson Tuesday Morning Forum. My name is Winston Robinson. I am a facilitator, along with other facilitators, my co-facilitators, Ms. Laura McClay, Ms. Carlinia Ivory, Ms. Jackie Walt Edwards Walton, Ms. Natalie McElrath, Ms. Mary Johnson, Mr. Steve Johnston, our website editor, and Ms. Sarita Sherrill, our chaplain. Our forum runs from 8.30 to 9.45, at which time we will pause for announcements from the audience. Announcements can also be sent to S. Johnston, with a T, at TuesdayForumCharlotte.org. We always begin with a prayer from our chaplain, Ms. Sarita. Uh, Ms. Sarita, would you please come on and give us a prayer, please? We ask your blessings today for the brokenhearted. If teenagers think no one loves them, help them to know that your mom or dad are going to work every day. They know that. That's why they go to work. God doesn't just offer bandages for our wounds. Power heals broken hearts, souls from the inside out because he cares about every one of us. God bless this nation, bless our state, our county, our city, our neighborhoods, and our homes. Let us say together. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ms. Sarita. If we have anyone with us today for the first time, please identify yourselves with a hand raised and an introduction. <laughs> you have way there. This is what he say. You mind standing and telling us who you are? Hi, I'm Dominique Arrington. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist and a farmer, and we facilitate outdoor learning on our farm for marginalized communities and social Nice. Good, good, good introduction. Might be some opportunity for you. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I kid, I kid. But, uh, <laughs> thank you again for that. Uh, our guest today, our guests, uh, we have quite a group. We have uh, Mr. Mies Ivy, 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 uh huh, and Miss Catherine Furman Sellers of United Way yes. of Greater Charlotte. The United Way of Greater Charlotte there uh, are telling us, or more of a, a kind of a follow up slash telling us about their new business model in which they give the community resources in the nonprofit world. They have so much that they will tell us in this presentation that I am personally looking forward to. But uh, following this presentation, we will take questions from the audience. Please raise your hand and I will call on you in the order in which your hand was raised. We will have somebody writing it down, so believe me, I will see your question. Questions are questions. They should be questions, not statements, and limited to 30 seconds. Answers should be, we'll give you a bit of grace, but consciously around that one minute kind of time. But oh, again, questions should be questions. Make sure you uh, pose your question as a question. And I know, I know. Go back. And the question should be no longer than 30 seconds. So with that said, the introduction uh, to the United Way, please, Ms. Ivy, whenever you would like. So good morning. Good morning. Is this working? Oh, you got to turn it off. Hit the button. Hold it a little. Okay. Ooh, get a mic. So I'm Jamise Ivy, so Ivy Y, um, and I am the director of community initiatives for United Way. Sorry, we're having technical issues. Would you stand right where that chair is? Stand right by the Okay. Which way do you? Oh, I'm sorry. Which way do you want me to stay? Thank you. Anywhere. No, no, no. Just the office. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I am Jimmy Sivey. I'm the Director of Community Initiatives for United Way. Um, <clears throat> I started United Way, I've been with United Way since September 2021. 
um, and Catherine Berman Sellers, um, our Chief Impact Officer is here as more on support today, but hopefully I can run the show and answer any questions you may have. But I am here today to um, <clears throat> present or tell you more information about our grants which are opening soon. Um, I watched the video from last year when Laura and Catherine was here and saw that they promised that we would come back in a timely fashion to give you information and time and not the last minute. So that is what I'm doing today to make sure that you know that our grants are about to open and what that may look like. Um, so I just have a few slides. So I'm gonna start with our United Neighborhoods grants and then our United Charlotte grants. <clears throat> so another thing that happened since last time is when Laura and Catherine was here last time, we were United Way of Central Carolinas, and since then we have changed our name to United Way of Greater Charlotte. Um, and so, just a few slides on what that looks like and what we've been presenting. Um, having a clear way, so being transparent, the open way, um, being collaborative, the bold way, not being afraid to stand up and do what's right, and being impactful, so using data to uh, make our decisions on funding and all the programs and services that we're able to give to the community. So we at United Way, um, we have kind of three main grant streams that we um, run. So as the director, I um, manage the United, United Neighborhoods grants and the United Charlotte grants. Um, a home for all is coming up and I think Catherine will be able to talk more about that at a later time. I am not that great at doing that one yet. So today we're gonna to stick with United Neighborhoods and Unite Charlotte. So United Neighborhoods, and again, United Neighborhoods is our grant um, process that we bring a program or service to a community. Um, so when Catherine was here last time, we were in three neighborhoods and today we're in about 86 neighborhoods. So we did that in about a year span. Um, to be more impactful in the neighborhoods who really need programs and services that our nonprofit um, partners can offer. So with United Neighborhoods, we uh, take the barriers out for residents to get that program service. So nonprofits for decades have done work where they have a building that they do their program service and then they ask people to get to their building. But what we notice is that sometimes residents cannot do that. Um, they work, they may not have transportation, um, have children, all the other things that may prevent them from getting to a place to, to get a program or service that may really benefit their family. So under United Neighborhoods, when we fund an organization, we are asking that organization to bring their program or service to a neighborhood or a corridor so that residents can easily get that service. So those grants are opening um, well, we're, we're going to start with the letter of interest. And so any organization to they can look at um, the areas that we are serving. They can look and see what the priorities for those areas are. And if they uh, think that their organization um, can help with that priority, we ask them to submit a letter of interest. So they tell us, hey, I want to work in the base four corridor. Um, and I want to be able to help with this need that the corridor has. So that is going to open on June 26th. And then that is going to close on July 10th. Um, then, we make award announcements in December. So after our board looks at uh, what our recommendations are and approves of them, then we make an announcement. And then our grant cycle would be from January 2024 to December 2024. These grants are open to any nonprofit committed, committed to working in um, the board or opportunity. So this can be grassroots nonprofit, this can be a large nonprofit, this can be a mid nonprofit. Any nonprofit who is doing great work and can commit to coming to a community is able to apply for these grants. Um, for more information on this, um, please visit our grants page, so United Way Greater Charlotte um, um, dot org, and then go to our grants page, and you can see um, all the things that we have for that. So, for folks who may want, we have a letter of how to write an effective letter of interest class that um, agencies can. Uh, sign up for to learn more about what we're looking for in our LOIs. We're also doing an information session, so if agencies want to learn more information about it, all of that information is on our website. If you want to email us or have any questions about this, you can contact us at United Neighborhoods at United Way, Greater Charlotte, I'm sorry, greatercolt.org. 
and these sausage. Amen. So then Unite Charlotte, and our Unite Charlotte grants are for grassroots agencies um, who are led by people of color. And so what we find is grassroots organizations are usually ran by people who live in a community and see a need for the community to create a nonprofit in order to uh, fulfill that need. And so uh, our Unite Charlotte grantees, we provide money and funding for smaller agencies um, to help build their capacity. So to help make sure that they are in good standing at the nonprofit status, to help them be a, fund a good fundraiser, help them with their budgeting, whatever they may need to be sustainable and continue to do their program service in their neighborhoods. This is what Unite Charlotte is for. So our applications for Unite Charlotte open June 12th and they close July 30th. Um, we will announce the award for Unite Charlotte also in December and their grant cycle will also be January 2024 to December 2024. So these grants are open to any grassroots nonprofit who is founded and led by a person of color. Um, and so we welcome not, uh, those grassroots agencies to come if they want that capacity building with us. I also wanted to share today, which I'm very excited about, I hope that people in this room will take me up on my offer, but we are looking for community volunteers um, to help us read grant applications and make funding recommendations for Unite Charlotte. Um, for more information about the grants, you can visit our website, but if you are interested in volunteering with us, I would love for you to email us at unitecharlotte at unitedwaygreaterclt.org so that I can give you more information about how you can um, and volunteer with us. And so what that looks like is, I don't know how many applications we'll get, but we split that up into groups of folks of volunteers, and those volunteers read and score those applications, and then go with us. Uh, they, we will have a, a presentation for um, our grantees, so our volunteers will read applications, watch a presentation, and then as a group help us decide who um, will fund for those grants. Um, and so yes, so just hoping that you guys take me up on the offer and um, volunteer with us. So we'll, 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 so we'll, we'll take questions after the presentation. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 uh, we have a list, but you just second. All right, to the end, you let now. Now we'll uh, have time for questions. We have Mr. King Coos with the first question. Uh, sir, what's your name? Cedric Thomas. Cedric Thomas, you are number two. And we get I see a third back. All right, Mr. Coates. Is there a scale or a percentage on funds that actually go to the constituents who do the work and provide the services compared to the nonprofit management and staff? Because there has been some historical uh, Exceptions that uh, the monies go to the people that run the program and the actual people who need the program and get the services get virtually nothing. So with our funding, we give unrestricted funding to um, nonprofits. So we understand that nonprofits need funding in order to keep their lights on and to keep their staff paid. So we give them that funding to do whatever they need to to make sure that their nonprofit is up and running. But they do owe us programmatic outcomes. So they they can pick up to three outcomes that they say that they're going to work towards and tell us how many people that they're going to serve with the dollars that we give them. Um, so that is how we keep them accountable of the work that they are going to do. Um, industry standard is like 20% needs to go to overhead and the 80% needs to go to programs for nonprofits. And so we do hold our um, agencies to that to that standard. Does that answer? Uh, yeah, got it. I feel like a follow-up is coming, but we'll put it on back on the list. Mr. Thomas. Hi, Kevin Thomas. Part A. Does uh, the corridor, does both grants provide uh, money for the corridors? And part two is if you volunteer to to, uh, to review the grants and you also receive them, those are very good questions. So the first one was, does funding go to the corridors for both grants? 
So yes, so United Neighborhoods is specific to each corridor. So each corridor has a grant pool um, and agencies who commit or agree to work in that corridor gets that grant pool and works directly in that corridor. Unite Charlotte, those are not really be considered place based, but a lot of the agencies that we serve are working in your corridor. So they don't have to like tell us, oh, we are just going to work here, we're going to work here. They can really work forever. For Unite Charlotte, we're really looking to build their capacity um, and then hope to keep them with us to then go to the United Neighborhoods grant um, cycle to then work in a specific corridor if they choose to. So, yes, both grants do directly serve each corridor. Your second question was if you volunteer and you also receive the grant, and no, <laughs> so you have to do one or the other. Um, I think I'm gonna say something, and Catherine can tell me if, if I'm wrong. So for Unite Charlotte, there are three cohorts. So Unite Charlotte, first year, second year, and third year. So we have volunteers for all three years. Um, so if and again, tell me if I'm wrong. If you apply for first year funding. And want to volunteer for third year? Did that happen? Theoretically, yes. So theoretically, we could do that, but you cannot apply. You cannot apply for a granting pool that you are volunteering to make applications for. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Carrie Nelson, I was just wondering uh, for reading the applications, what time? Uh, What's involved? So, um, and again, if you are, if you're, if you think you're even interested in volunteering, please email us. I have a one pager that I'll email to you with like all of the information. But we are allowing you to pick to do United Charlotte one, two, or three, um, and each of them have a different schedule. They have different open and close dates. Um, so we're asking our volunteers to look at the dates and whichever kind of group of dates work best for your schedule um, to pick that cohort to read applications for. But what it looks like is um, for United Charlotte this year, we're just doing applications. So you'll read about a one page application um, and then you will be placed in a small group of about five people and you all will. I'm assuming about 11 applications, but we never know how many we're actually going to get. So I'm assuming the small groups will read about 11 applications each and then dwindle those applications down to five of your top um, ones that you like. And then those five will do a presentation with your group. Um, and then you will look at their presentation and their application together to determine who you think should get funded. So that's kind of how that process goes. So uh, if I remember correctly, we have Everything will be done virtually except for the presentation here. So we did mix some virtual at home things with in person. Before we go to Ms. Jackie and then Ms. Carlin, uh, just to specify for clarity, would you mind articulating the difference since between the three levels of Unite Charlotte and also for Unite Neighborhoods? I know uh, I'm the VP of Community Engagement for our Neighborhood Association. However, we're not, uh, we don't have nonprofit status. Would that be a barrier? Yeah, advice. Advice first. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm VP. <laughs> so, Unite Charlotte, the years um, that Winston is talking about. So, our first year grantees, um, it is 25 agencies that we fund, um, and they receive $25,000 in funding. Um, for monies um, where they can use to hold build their capacity. Uh, for those 25 first year agencies, we do require them to do a Duke nonprofit management certificate course, which we pay for and bring Duke um, Uptown Charlotte. So those agencies sit in an eight week class um, to make sure that they understand how to run a nonprofit. I'm not sure how many people run a nonprofit, but it is not easy. Um, it is a lot of work, a lot of paperwork, a lot of crossing your teeth and dotting your eyes. And so we want to make sure that our agencies understand all that and are in good standing so that they can be sustainable. So we start them with the Duke uh, nonprofit certificate. And at the end, they are graduate of Duke University. So um, with a certificate. Um, and so we do offer that with them. And then we offer different kind of trainings for them. So this year we're doing a training on fundraising, a training on how to make sure that your budgets um, look good. 
Um, we're doing a technology training to make sure their technology is up to date and working the best that they can for their um, organization. You know, I'm sorry, second year, um, this is a competitive process. So in second year, we go from funding 25 agencies to 20. And those 20, sorry, those 20 agencies receive 40,000 in funding. And then we give them 10,000 to work with an executive coach that will coach them on whatever they need um, to make their organization better. And so uh, the United States have two first year agencies, they can tell us who they want their coach to be and we pay that coach to work with them for a full year. So then we move from United Startup 2 to United Startup 3, and we go from 20 agencies to 10 agencies, and those 10 agencies receive $60,000 in funding, um, and then again, another $10,000 for um, their executive coach. I think I answered that question. United, and then you said United Neighborhoods for... Status. So, fiscal aid. Go for the fiscal aid. Can he have it with nonprofit status? Do you have to have nonprofit so, status? So we, yes, you need nonprofit status. Um, but you can use the fiscal agent. But you can use a fiscal agent if, if you need to. Um, and I think you were saying your organization under United Neighborhood. So for those that we just have a conversation, and so I think it's, we just need to sit down with the organization and have a conversation um, about your work and how we can better serve or work together. I know that's kind of the case for a lot of neighborhood associations, at least around, uh, along the Bay's Four Corridor. There is a five hundred one c three status. It's more of an organized group. Now we have uh, Miss Jackie Edwards Walk Walk Edwards. J E W. I know. I know that every time, Mister Doug. Um, you answer my question, please. Yay. <laughs> Miss Carly, you got me. Uh, with what you were just talking about and what you just said. Um, you have answered just for clarification purposes. You have all of this uh, opportunities to help people to, uh, you have what the Duke's certificate and you have where people learn how to fund nonprofit. What he alluded to was like the base for the quarter. What I would love to see is us to have something in this room where we bring or somewhere on the quarter individuals together because I think you guys used to do this and uh, go back to the basics and if you have a template something very simple mm -hmm. to help them from the beginning to the end I think that would increase it because the individuals on that quarter want are willing and like you said we're they might have an organization and do stuff, but it's not formal and it's nothing that will win um, a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I want to suggest that. I also want to say to um, Catherine, 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 it's Catherine. She, when you guys came last time, I asked a lot of questions. I wasn't the, I challenged. She has responded and done everything I asked. Now, what I did do was to volunteer to be, um, to uh, evaluate the grants. I ended up in the hospital, not because of that. Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> but it is very tedious. I would suggest that you might want to give a stipend for that. It is a lot of work. And I think young people like Cedric need to be able to do it. do it because it would help you to do a grant later. That's just a suggestion, so two suggestions. But you have, y'all did everything I asked. Thank you. So I will say, um, this year we, I think that we made the review process a lot easier. So it's a one page application this year. That's, that's it, literally one page that you have to read. And then we offer a rubric, so the rubric goes with each question and you score how you thought they answered that question. Um, and then we're doing presentation fairs for first year grantees this year because what we realized is folks that are doing nonprofit, uh, grassroots organizations specifically, they may have a full-time job um, or they may not know how to really write a grant because they don't, nonprofit isn't, you know, in their wheelhouse. 
And so we now have presentations for first year grantees too. So we're looking at their presentation and their application to make better decisions. So I do think, and I do hope that we make the process a lot more easier and not tedious. You have a dot, dot, dot with all that on there. I'm real, I got to see. Yep, and we have all that available. <laughs> I, I'm not following the rules either. I'm just like, yeah. All right, now we have questions from Mr. Coates. Then we're going to have Ms. McClady and uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Sure, Ms. Uh, Cheryl Manuel in the back. I don't know exactly or not, but was something similar to this done before? And to that extent, how do you safeguard against any particular area basically uh, uh, taking up? The bulk of the money for a specific area, while there are others out there that have not been as astute at working the system to get what they need. Do you have any kind of history that documents how you safeguard against that? And are you talking specifically for United Charlotte or United Neighborhoods? So for both. Um, so for you, United Neighborhoods, each corridor has a funding pool. So last year it was two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So nonprofits were able, any nonprofit was able to apply and tell us how much funding did they need to serve, how many people they said they can serve. Um, and so again, it's only two hundred and seventy thousand dollars for everyone. So based on those priorities and the agencies who said they can um, do something with each priority is how we made funding recommendations. So. No agency could go and get the whole $270,000. Um, and I think on average, our grants were between like twenty five dollars and 50000 per agency to work with about 25 people is what they said that they would do. So that's kind of how we safeguard that one of like no one is really getting the full pot of money. Um, for you know, Charlotte, those are kind of static grants. So all first year get twenty five thousand. All second year get forty thousand. All third year get sixty thousand. So everyone gets the same across the board. We'll come back to you, Mr. One second, I had something. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, what I did want to add is, so we don't have baseline data, but this is new. This is the first year we've been in this many corridors and neighborhoods. When we get our final year reports in December. People will report out by neighborhood within a corridor. So we will be able to see did one neighborhood get the bulk of people versus this neighborhood didn't get anything. And then we can collectively have a conversation and decide how to respond to that. So I don't have basic data for you because this is the first year, but we are mindful of that and we'll take that into consideration as we move forward. The other thing I would say is that. We are really committed to understanding the impact of our work. We don't just want to go through the motions. So we do, as, as Denise has said, every agency reports um, each year what they've done and what they've achieved within a corridor. We do hope next year to pilot in two neighborhoods um, an evaluation of what is the totality of our work, not just agency by agency, but when you think about it collectively, what have we achieved? And we know, you know, Nonprofits are great at saying I'm going to measure progress every single year when we're trying to deal with change that requires many, many years, right? So we know this is the long game, but it will at least begin to give us baseline data about what kind of change we're seeing in neighborhoods and how do we need to change to respond to that. But short version of your question, we'll have neighborhood and neighborhood reporting. All right, we have Ms. McClady, then Ms. Emanuel, then Ms. Uh, Walton. Okay, my question. You have the first, second, and third year, and they have coaches those two years. Do you all have a plan in place to monitor them after that third year to see how they're progressing and to assist them if they need assistance after that? You fund them $60,000 for that third year. That is a great question. Um, so, our agencies in, in any of our agencies that we fund can do United Charlotte and United Neighborhood. So they can do both. But what, how we want to keep our grantees for their third year is that we hope that they can do some work in United Neighborhood so we can continue to work with them and they be a part of the fold with us. Um, 
we have our first class of graduates and they all are still very much connected to us and we'll call any of us with um, anything that they may need help or support with. And so we are still very connected with our first class that has graduated all the years. So they are very much welcome to reach out to any of us for anything that they need. And then also to continue to get funding through United Neighborhoods with us. Um, that answer? Yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so you're a facilitator. It's a point of privilege. Absolutely. Okay. So that coach that's, that's assisting them for that ten thousand dollars, will they be able to uh, pay in the fourth year if it's funded? Will they continue to work with that coach? They will have a coach. Three years and that fourth year, will they have continue to have that coach and the Hey, I'll start and then if you got anything to add, really on that the microphones. Um, so Unite Charlotte is just up to three years, so after three years, then the funding does end. But agencies are able, if they want to, continue with their coach, but it would be on them to fund it. But our hope is by the third year that they know how to fundraise and their annual budget has increased from what it did when they started with us so that they are able to pay for their, that coach if they continue to be with that coach. Um, so that's kind of how, how we work that one. But Catherine may have something to add. So that, um, is that working? Well, she, well, uh, Ms. Freeman Sellers answered that question. You please turn your mic on, then turn it back on to you to speak. So what I was going to say is, um, it's going to sound a little bit like an excuse, and I don't mean it to, but United Charlotte is still pretty young as a program, and it has grown exponentially. When I was, I've been at United Way four years. When I got hired, it was a $200,000 program. It's now over a $3 million program. So when I say it's grown exponentially, that's number one understatement. We have been working to get that evaluative structure around it so that we can understand the impact. And we have that in place now. So we do an organizational assessment. You may be familiar with this, but we do it at the first year and at the end of every successive year so we can track growth over time. We have not yet had the opportunity to do that organizational assessment with a graduating class, graduating cohort, simply because we have just launched doing that kind of assessment. So no, I don't have that data to show what happens in the fourth year. Um, we can certainly, as Denise has said, they stay in our family. We stay connected to them. They don't go away. So I think the old notion of what was a, a partner agency with United Way is a little bit dated because we consider all of our graduated United Charlottes to continue to be partner agencies. We can ask them to fill out that organizational assessment. I'll be candid with you that getting them to do so and giving us the information back is going to be challenging. Right? So that's certainly an intent. And a hope, but I don't. I don't hold up a great deal of hope that somebody that we're no longer funding is going to give me back a survey that is a little bit lengthy to take when I'm having trouble getting a survey back from people I'm currently funding. So that's me. Again, it sounds a little bit like an excuse, and don't mean it to. But short answer: No, I don't have the data. Yes, we'll try to get it. It's probably going to be messy. All right, uh, Ms. Manuel. I say good morning. Presentation. Mm -hmm. This is kind of follow up to uh, Ms. Carlina. So, like with the neighbor, United Unite Neighborhoods, how many neighborhoods do you have? Question one. And then question two if nonprofit organizations are applying for funding, how do you assure that the neighborhood leaders themselves know who's applying, bringing work inside the community that perhaps don't even have a relationship? With community, but can write a good, sophisticated grant to do the work with the people. Mm -hmm. First question was how many neighborhoods are we in? Um, so on paper, we're in 86 neighborhoods across Charlotte and then in North Mex. 86 neighborhoods. Um, our, grant, our grantees can choose out of those neighborhoods to work in. 
how do we make sure that agencies who are applying have relationship in the neighborhood? Is your second question? So yeah, I was saying like if an agency is applying and they choose to come, just say Washington. But they're coming not necessarily through Maddie or whoever the neighborhood appointment president now. But then they get the grant with no relationship to come. How is that organization really going to have the impact from a very beginning, good start, because there wasn't a relationship built? Because we can constantly write good grants. But it goes back to his question earlier. He indicated that the organization doesn't necessarily have a Bible or three. Seems like that ought to be resources. Helping that organization get to where they need so they can do the work themselves, both inside and outside of it, versus bringing in. Got it. Asking. So, on our application, and you make a good point that some people are really good at writing applications, but one of the questions that we had last year, and I think it's still on there this year, I'll double check, but we asked agencies to tell us if they are currently doing work in the neighborhood that they plan to serve. And if they are doing work, what kind of work are they doing and who are they working with? So we do ask them to tell us that up front of, do you already have a relationship with, the, with this neighborhood? And what does that look like? So our grant process, grant making process, includes residents of each corridor. So residents can also tell us, hey, we know that this agency, we've seen this agency before, they do great work. Or no, we have not seen this agency before, but they can offer something that we need. And so we'll work with them and see, see how this goes. Um, what I am hearing today, I believe, is that there are smaller agencies along the corridor of Baysport who could use some support that we could offer. Um, and I think I hear Ms. Carlinia saying, if United Way can be a convener of that to bring those agencies in the room um, and help build their capacity and help build relationship across those groups of organizations to better serve the residents of the area. That is above my pay grade, so I'm going to let Catherine answer that, but I will start by saying that I know that at United Way, our capacity is not that great, like we don't have that new staff. So, but I do think, I mean, me as a director could think about how to make that work, but I'll let you answer and see if you have any answer to what that may look like. To be a pilot. So I'm gonna respond with a question. Can you articulate for me what you are asking for? Mr. Manuel and Ms. Uh, The back row, both. Back row. Back. Uh, well, basically, what I'm asking for is to have, and you know, you guys used to have it. I'm not sure how long ago. She don't like to go older. <laughs> basically, you know, I would volunteer like Mary and uh, myself to be a convener of individuals that we know were like me. You could apply. And we never had the opportunity, or they don't know what everything you're telling us. They don't come to you support, but they get good work. So could we? Because you can't, you cannot do everybody. You can't do everybody who wants to be some. So we're saying, okay, you have an opportunity to come together to form a five hundred one C to form, be a part of the United Neighborhood of United Charlotte. Bring them into a room, and we'll talk about our four. Okay. That's what we're asking for. So I know you don't have the staff, but if this is something that you could come in and tell us the process, a dot, dot, dot of what needs to be done. And that answers her question because right now, in years in African American neighborhoods, and y'all all know this, the same people think they're the leaders forever. And they don't necessarily always have a good relationship with the community. So they can write grants, get grants. Jackie said over here, you need to have, and you said we asked the question, who do they deal with? They, you need a support letter from who they deal with, and then you need an after letter saying this is what, to verify this is what happened. Is it trust? Yeah, it is. Because there are people who always get the money. So I guess I'm asking for a couple of things. 
I'm asking for you to use us as a pilot program and see if that will work. And then if it works, maybe you can go to other neighborhoods to do it. I think you've done a fantastic job because you came to three, now you're at 86. But we are saying, and y'all help me, that we still feel like the Baby Sport Road Corridor is not covered like it could be. And, and dotted. And, and dotted. And also understanding what neighborhoods are already doing for themselves to get them to the next level. And I can use that. I just should watch the mic. So I have a partner called Council for Black Health. They had money for home and summer. So they took that neighborhood uh, last year and help them run a plan how to begin to put stuff on paper so they can keep them home. But that helps when you build them from inside. But you need to start with them. Because, um, like, I'm not sure how many other neighborhoods might even know the fact that they can um, have a group share. They may not have to have a 501 system. So that opened up a whole whole gateway this morning, I think, for him if he wants to apply to that neighborhood. Because now they can get a group share. Yeah. So. So a few things. One is we absolutely, so when, when he says 86 neighborhoods, I want to clarify that that's 13 separate grant pools. All right, so we have 13 separate grant pools that operate across the city and then one up, one up in North Mecklenburg because we have in three localities, we split the grant pool. We, we created two grant pools for one locality, recognizing the fact that there might be um, a large African American population, but also a large immigrant refugee Latinx population. So we wanted to distinguish that they might have need and different needs. The other thing I want to say is that the intention, and I know that's always a little bit dangerous because there can be a drift between what your intention is and what your impact is, but the intention is always to go in um, with humility and recognize the assets of each community we are working in. So we are never going to go into a community and say, here's what we think your needs are, right? And here's what we think you should be doing. We are always going to ask, tell us what services and programs you'd like to come into your community. And we will design our grant application on that, right? So everything that's on that application is a priority is articulated by the community. So that's two things. Um, in terms of your specific request, we spoke about this last year. We do have something called a block building program uh, where we fund organizations and work with them very intentionally to build their capacity to, to serve their neighborhoods more effectively. Again, you don't have to be a 501c3 to receive a block building grant. We would need to work through a fiscal agent or fiduciary. Um, but we certainly are open to having, and, and, and so what you're asking me is, can I come to you and work with you to establish your 501c3 status so that you can go get a grant? And I'm going to propose the reverse, right, is that we can again have a conversation about being a, receiving a block building grant, receive the grant, and then come into our family, and we'll work with you to get you, if you choose to have it, your 501c3 status. So it's a little bit different than what you... The, I'm going to switch the order on you, but I think it's a doable thing. And basically, I think what I'm asking is that we have an education session to tell individuals about this opportunity. About the block building opportunity? Block, or... block building. Uh, basically, I want to, right here, you have people from all over Charlotte. Okay. I'm asking to convene. Uh, Leaders, CMS, individuals from the Baby Sport Road community for you to do might be this session, but I want it to be extended a little further to talk about the basic template for the grant information. Do you understand what do y'all? I think I think so. Like elements of it, for example, um, the, the fiscal agency process, what does that take? What does that mean? How, if I'm doing work in an organization or individually and the community recognizes my effort, how can I get the support by offered by United Way? And I'm just a guy. So explaining the steps to get 
be in this hypothetical scenario supported from just being a guy on the ground doing the work? A B C. Just steps. steps. A, Not in the language of nonprofit. Uh, you know, just so my five year old could get it or understand. It. I don't think your five year old. But yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to corporate anyway. But, oh. um, I, I, I so I think he's more than happy, and Janice is more than happy to come share what United Way does with any group that you would want to convene. I, I, we, we are completely open and transparent and want people to be aware of what we do. We have information set and scheduled that will walk through the what we call our financial certification process, which will answer a lot of the questions about the fiscal agency. So I would invite you to go you know, log on and go to our website and, and see what information sessions are coming up and register for those, because I think that would answer some additional questions. Again, if you need us, I'm, I'm good at a lot of things. I'm not necessarily an expert on how to get you your final and secret status. So I don't know that I could come in and walk you Dot, 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 so we're going to do that. Um, okay, I have a Bible on secret, but I want to know what, okay, now that I have it, I sit here and I'm just, you know, just say this. But, okay, now that there's a whole lot of people who have it and those who don't have it, so you might have a combination of people in the room. But basically what I'm saying is, okay, now that I have it, I want you to come in with um, and basically tell me, okay, these are the forms. I don't do well going online. I'm just talking about me, and there might be other people. I want you guys to come in and say, this is what you need to do to get up the car to apply for this grade. It's really simple. It's the ABCs of how to obtain this United Neighborhood in United Charlotte. And I am saying that, thank you, you have all this online, you have all this, you've added all this great stuff, but I'd like to see a room of people, at least half of this room or whole this whole room, from the Babies Ford Road and surrounding corners to come in and hear this presentation. And we can arrange it and schedule it, which would be willing to do it. That's what I'm asking. So I think what they're asking is our information sessions and we can do that in person. So yes, we can do that. So all the things that we're choosing to register online, we would be more than happy to do that in person. Also, I know that we're probably over moderator, <laughs> but I also want to say, I think what I'm also hearing is that there are organizations that you know who are doing great work, but are not getting the funding. This is the time for you, and we're gonna pass this information to all of you, for you to encourage those organizations to apply for this funding that's about to open. And we will bring them also so you okay. can answer questions. Mm -hmm. And please, <laughs> walk into the room, and uh, she is working with you guys. Please let her know, Ms. Jacobs, that I am not complaining. I'm just trying to help. <laughs> <laughs> but she's already here. <laughs> Good job of trying to get us involved and engaged. Nice. I love Ms. Jacobs, too. Um, but yes, we, we can do that. We can get that set up. Um, please share the word about our grants opening to organizations who may want to apply, and then let's set up a time for us to come back and do a presentation in person. Okay. All right, we're going to add that's the end of dialogue. So, you know, no more back and forth. We just let that go. Kind of, uh, that was very important information. So now we have uh, Ms. Jackie, we have uh, Mary, Ms. Mary, and uh, Ms. McClay. They brought something to my mind. I know y'all did select uh, two organizations in Hidden Valley um, to fund last year. And I thought that was phenomenal. My question is on bringing in folks to serve as mentors or coaches. That was a lady who made a presentation here, um, Nick Alexander, on emotional intelligence. And that is so key. I did it since I was in nonprofit. Um, to have that for leadership, a 
many of these nonprofits. Um, would you pass us our information? Um, what do y'all think? Yes. Is that the question? Are you? Yes. What do y'all think? Intelligence piece for nonprofit management leaders. As a part of the certification process, like for United Charlotte, Both for example. Okay. Yes. Go ahead, uh, Miss Mary. Miss Mary Wynn. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Wynn. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to try to chat for humanity to be a business supervisor. One of the things that I wanted to kind of piggyback off of what uh, the ladies over here were saying and what you all were saying, my question is around uh, partnership with organizations that help to build capacity uh, for organizations such as nonprofits, maybe such as LISP, or what I'm hearing is the fiduciary responsibility or a fiscal agent, um, you know, maybe nonprofit, uh, the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits. If you all are partnering with them to put on some type of symposium to answer what she was saying. If you partner with those type of organizations to, um, so maybe you don't have the capacity to um, answer some of the questions or do some of the work because that's not your, your niche, but some of the other organizations in the community, such as LIST or North Carolina Center for Nonprofits. We partner closely with LIST. So that's short answer there. We can certainly look into the North County Center for Nonprofits. Um, if, if so, we can look into it. We don't currently. That's G and K. So another. I'm sorry. I just want to answer our question with your staff. We got any partners with the Duke Center for Nonprofit Management to build past among grants. Thank you. Um, my question is. And I know you mentioned about the grant, but sometimes I know I hear a lot of times when other nonprofits, especially they've been around a long time, but not long enough to really understand their dynamics with the United Way. Sometimes the um, the grants can be hard for people to understand the question that you're asking for people to fill out. And I've looked on um, some of the things because I became really affiliated with you. I have been more because of the for council builders. But when you all are doing the grants or whoever is doing it, it needs to be understandable enough for our older nonprofits. Um, because when I look at it, sometimes you don't understand what those questions are or what you're asking for. And still, a lot of people don't know what they're asking for. So, but my question is also as well, that's just information I think we want to go back and look at so that way some of your grassroots nonprofits are taking advantage of the grants. Excuse me, my name is April. Thanks. Um, and then secondly, sometimes the partnerships can be hard for people to get into. Um, United Way is like a hub when it comes to filtering out uh, grants and monies to the communities as well as um, your grant process. And a lot of times the money is not getting to some of the other organizations as well as trying to partner. And I think also to the partnering um, tactics can be a little bit more open for much smaller nonprofits because when other people have tried, either you don't reach back out to them, let them know that they're profitable or like some of the other ones stated, have open dialogue and give us something, you give the presentation, you don't have anything to do with anybody. That's just not good when, like she stated, I'm not good with doing um, being on social media and all that. And as well as you can see, it's not have something so that way it's easier for us to go back in to pull it up, know your name, your information, because by the time most of you get out of here, they're going to try to say, what was that, um, that website again? You know, what was that? I mean, I've been on some 52 years old, so a lot of times I can't remember. Thank you. And so what I'm just saying is, having that dialogue, I'm open, I'm willing to do that and make it more liaisonable and make your information more adequate so people can understand what you're asking be more open. Okay. I'll try to remember in the order. 
So application, you were right that we, we used to have phone applications that have words that people who are not involved in nonprofit wouldn't understand. This year, the applications arbitrarily they change. I think it's like five or six questions on them. And we have tried to make sure that the wording is understandable for anyone inside or outside of the nonprofit world. We've also had some of our agencies that we've gone review the application with us to make sure that we are saying the right words and it's making enough sense. Those applications, I'm saying this, I did my, never mind. I was gonna say those applications will be on our website for you to look at the questions and see what they have changed to, but I'm committed to making sure that I can print those out and bring those whenever we come back to um, have an open dialogue. That was one, two. And that was um, I'll also say that I just hired three people to work with me, um, and my team is out in the community all the time. And so and this is for anyone, any organization that has questions or individuals that has questions, my team is literally out. We're driving all day, every day to do meetings um, with people, to come to neighborhoods with people. So if, if anyone has questions or want to meet with us face to face, we are more than open to that and actually very much enjoy being out in the community other than in our office. So um, we we want to be relatable in that way. And I do want to thank you guys and Brian brought a great point of everyone doesn't do this online. And so I do want to offer that we are more than willing to come face to face. We are in coffee shops, we're breakfast, we're at archive almost every day. So we are out in the community to get to know you more. So if online things don't work for you, please always feel free to reach out to us. We will set up a meeting to come and talk with you. All right, we have Ms. McClay, then I have a question. Okay, so our old school, and I came from corporate America, and United Way was where they came to the corporations and asked for staff to be known to the United Way. We raised all of this money. And because of social, social media, uh, we're so in, inundated with so many different social media outlets right now. It's hard for me to keep up with what United Way is doing now. Compared to the United Way, what we used to, what the funds used to be raised, and they were going to some of the larger organizations. And when the funding, most of the funding was going, and we knew exactly how much money was raised that particular year and the dollars that were distributed out throughout the community to the various organizations, you know, like it may have been done for, for the family services, but there was there were large organizations that was receiving this money. So now, am I clear that some of the fundraising that is done by the old corporate United Way is being used for this in addition to funding those organizations that have been funded only in years for, uh, to help the community, those that are deprived of getting, you know, assistance with uh, uh, health issues and food and housing. So yes, ma'am, thank you for the question. Um, I wanna start just by acknowledging that what you knew about a United Way 10 years ago is no longer true, like none of it. So I know people have an impression still because of the name that United Way is this fundraising powerhouse and we're raising, you know, back in the day we would raise $40 million a year. Now the truth of it was that a lot of that didn't even come into Charlotte because it could go anywhere. It could go to a college, it could go to anywhere, literally. Um, but we still would say we raised that money. And yes, we gave it away to large established nonprofits and it was the same set of partners every single year. We have been on a journey over the past five years completely changing our business model. That's driven in part by the fact that our fundraising has continued to decline year over year. That corporate campaign model where we show up at your workplace, it was us and ASC, and nobody else got to go in. It was, it was closed, right? That's gone. Cam corporate campaigns now are wide open, you can give to anybody. That horse is out of the barn, it's not coming back in, and it has made it exceedingly difficult for United Way to continue with the same fundraising model it had for years. So we raised considerably less than we have previously. Right? So we raised about 20 million a year. 
And that includes all forms of funding now because we've worked to really diversify how we get our money. So we get grants as well. So we go look for grants, we write grants, apply for grants. That's how Denise's team has expanded, right? Because we've got grant funding to do that. Uh, we're doing major gift campaigns. And I say this with trepidation, we now take government money. Okay? So our fund mating model has changed dramatically. And we raise less. So we've been on a five-year journey to respond to all of that and do what we think is the best we can with the money that remains to us. And so we pivoted completely away from our old model. So all of those larger organizations that we used to give money to, as of this grant year, have all been defunded. And we threw everything into our neighborhood work. And that's what fueled this expansion from three neighborhood-based grant pools to 13. All right? We would love to do more. I would love to pour twice as many, three times as many resources into your neighborhoods, but we're constrained by our own funders, right? And so we will give out as much as we can, but it's always gonna to be tied to how much we raise every year. And that model has been disruptive. Okay, so my question is, and I think this would help uh, with the, the uh, the online, uh, I want to say monopoly. Well, I just want to know there is, uh, there are relationships with institutions where you could establish drops. For example, I know if I want a Pride magazine or a County News monthly, I can go to the YMCA, McCrory YMCA, or the Allegra Westbrooks y Library and pick it up almost on schedule to when it releases. Like if there could be an opportunity to drop a packet of information about a particular grant around the cycle that will allow, uh, you know, people like Ms. Carlinia Ivory or, or April, Ms. April to just pick up the grant, uh, pick up the packet, read the information, then do the necessary steps to uh, uh, become an applicant. Is that something that will be doable? I won't say that it's not doable. I guess, what is your time? Are you wanting us to do that this year? Well, I, I mean, just another option for people who don't have online access. Because then what I have to think about with this online access is our application is online. So then I have to think about how do we move that out of online and paper form to get back to us. So I cannot commit to being able to completely have options offline this year, but I can commit to trying. No. But not the process, maybe more just a point of contact to say this is the system, this is the process. We're going to have, you're going to have, to, you can't duck computers in 2023 at all, but at least making a point of contact to say this application process is now open. We, you can, can, we can absolutely put paper copies. I, I did. I told you. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> we can put paper copies of the application anywhere you want. Absolutely. The reason I shook my head that we can't move it offline is because of that reporting piece. I mean, at the beginning of this conversation, you guys were pressing on what's the data say, what's the data say. The only way I'm going to get the data back is through our online application. So that's, I'm just giving the explanation for why it has to be online. But yeah, we can put a paper copy of the application in a library if they're willing to hold it in here. I mean, yeah, absolutely. But then we can submit on Yahoo. But that's why I want the class to show me how to submit. But long as you establish that point of contact, everything can be worked out from them. Now that they know you have interest in being an applicant. All right, Ms. Nelson. Um, I understand your funding constraints mm -hmm. uh, are definitely different than in the past. Do it is United Way able to help organizations find other funding sources outside of United Way? Like, uh, so supplement, I guess. I'm sorry, but our hope is that when agencies go through us for funding, that it opens doors for other funding. So even with our grassroots organizations, especially, that is why we are helping to make sure that they have what they need to be in good standing as a nonprofit, so they can go to other funders and get more money. Um, so. That is our kind of our whole hope for that is that we are helping them to 
be sustainable, but they do get other funding outside of us. Like we don't want to be the only funder. Locating those funding sources. Part of any grant. Part of any grant training would include grant prospecting, is basically what you're asking for. So yes. Is that it? Do I have any more questions? Really? Split it up. Congratulations. I just can I say one thing? Uh, well, so for that, you want to close, have a closing statement and allow people to uh, contact you. Leave yeah. your information, please. So again, I'm Jimmy Siley, Director of Community Initiatives. I do believe I have cards today, so I can leave the card. Um, I've learned less come with paper things next time. I want to thank you all for your time and for your questions. Um, I think it is, this always helps us be better in our grant making process. And we do take what you say um, and try to make it better for the next time. I also have to thank Winston because Winston stayed on the phone with me for hours on Friday to prepare to be with you all today. So I have to, he did. I mean, like we, we heard each other's lunch orders as we were trying to get lunch and chat. So I have, he's a great, and thank you so much for preparing for today. Um, I look forward to continue working with you all. I look forward to hearing um, about a date that may work for us to come back and be able to present our information session in person. So again, thank you. Again, thank you for giving me the time this morning. Thank you so much, guys. Please, a uh, round of applause for me. Now we will go into room announcements. If you have an announcement, please raise your hand and stand. Uh, Miss Emmanuel, you please start. I say good morning again. I'm Cheryl Emmanuel. What an honor it is always to be before the elders. Um, on Thursday, May 25th, I did send the flyer in. However, I will leave my name. I'll stay back just for a moment. May 25th, we are launching the second annual Maybe Smith Board. Women's Health Equity Institute. I've had the privilege in this county to serve and retire from Mecklenburg County Public Health, but I've never stopped serving. Um, the two things that I've learned from Ms. Sarah uh, Stevenson that I love, uh, Ms. Teresa Elder when I worked at Public Health, was to leave something back in the name of our elders while they're living. And so I got one last message from Ms. Elder before she um, transitioned. She said, whatever I do, Cheryl, whatever you do, Cheryl, don't forget about Lady Smith Moore. So Ms. Lady Smith Moore, if you Google uh, YouTube, uh, B. Thompson came last year. Thank you to the group we presented that we were trying to get this off the ground. And we did while Ms. Major was living. And um, she's the first African-American to break the color line for those of us that had the privilege to sit at a leadership table for public health. And that job has never been easy. Few of us got a chance to sit there. And um, so I encourage us to listen to our story on um, um, two um, YouTube video. And we're moving forward with her um, legacy. And this week, um, Thursday night, you're going to hear some fantastic data that you and some Charlotte students have done. Um, you would think there's directories for women to access services, but it's very difficult for us as women to matriculate and navigate services in this county. And we're getting ready to build a powerhouse. Um, in this baby's name around him. So I ask you to join us on Thursday night um, at 6 p.m. If you go on the councilforblackhealth.org, you may get the information. I will stand back for a moment and make sure anybody that's interested in how you access getting in on Thursday night. The Council for Black Health is a national organization of black researchers around the country. Um, and I'm just privileged to sit in the midst of um, Black professors around the country that I read in my textbooks years ago when I was trying to get a public health degree. And they've come together as one class. But thank you all. Thank you, families, for letting me come to um, say, let's go and help change and make health equity a reality. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Walton. Uh, I don't so much have an announcement, Duke, but I do want to celebrate Shirley Emanuel, not only has she been around for health equity? But in the 80s, Cheryl worked for Seaver's Deal. When there were no CDCs, there were no community engagement folk, 
So when you hear her talk about neighborhood and building them up, she is an expert before all of this other stuff around community today. I will serve with that. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've all pointed that out. Anybody else have, have an announcement, uh, Sarita? You charged me last year, this organization charged me to bring together a group of two deep organizations. Well, there are three of us now, and that was one. So I'm still going to work until we get every, every organization that celebrates Juneteenth together, because we are one and we need each other. My point is, on the 5th of June, we will have our third annual bank raising at the Ebenezer Baptist Church. It's at 2020 West Sugar Creek Road. It's a 15 minute ceremony, but we need you there because there are too many NIA flags that are saying Juneteenth, and they are not. Uh, ben Hate designed the flag for Juneteenth, and it was stolen she tried to steal it. We we nationally had to get behind that and stop that. But then should be someplace on the 19th of June celebrating uh, his flag. We are going to tell you what the flag means and we're going to raise the flag. And Reverend um, Lynch is the brother, the pastor of the church, is the brother of our former attorney general for the United States. I had the opportunity to meet her, him, and his dad. He won't be there the fifth because his dad passed. And he's they were very close. And, and if you were close to your dad, you know what I mean. Uh, but uh, his assistant, Reverend Hayes, called me and gave us permission. He had already given us permission to raise the flag forever whenever we want to in the month of June. We're not going to do that without permission every year. His assistant called and gave us permission, and we're going to raise that flag. I have it in my truck now. And celebrate Juneteenth. The ceremony is only going to last about 15 minutes. So you can come and be there at 1130. We'd appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Sarita and Ms. Carlene. <laughs> Ms. Carlene. I just want to, uh, when I come on Tuesday morning, I come here representing Shepherd and Kirk School. And we each have uh, sort of community uh, organizations that we go mm -hmm. to and try to keep them informed. I want you to know, as you probably know, you know we have a new superintendent who is first African American female um, superintendent. And not because of that, you know, <laughs> but because she. she that the job uh, because um, she was qualified. I'd love for us to, in the near future, she starts July 1, to uh, invite her to this forum. So any questions that you might have, I'd be answered. May I say something? Holly, did you make that permission for us? No, I will, Ms. Barney. Okay. <laughs> So it's possible. If you could tell me, give me some dates. You, you get the date for her, and Jackie and I will work together to make sure she can come. I will make you can have it. Yes. And she knows a lot about the farm. I planted the seed. She said she wanted to come. So you know, that should be a very easy connection. So uh, if there are no more announcements, actually, let me make one. July 15th, it will be the greatest party you will ever attend in your life. Right at West Complex 1600 West Trade Street, it is the seventh, fifth, sixth installment of a vibe outside. Again, it is a community festival that celebrates the art and creativity and diaspora of Black Charlotte. Again, that is July 15th from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. at West Complex 1600 West Trade Street. Like, again, you do not want to miss it. Ms. Carmen. Same day, but I'm so glad you said three o'clock that morning. The uh, Indaba uh, for the blessed quarter yes. will be having a virtual uh, Zoom on safety for that area. 
and I'll give you more information as we get close for this week, July 15th. Perfect. So learn about safety online and come to the after party at about hour Saturday on July 15th. Thank you all for coming this Tuesday. Uh, hope to see you next Tuesday. Please come back, tell your friends, and join us for another edition of Sarah Stevenson Tuesday Morning Forum. Thank you guys for coming out.